Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear us well? As well? Okay, great. Okay, hello one and all and welcome to the INSS. My name is Michal Khatuel and I am... You cannot hear me? Just keep going and we'll take care of it. To the technicians. Okay, I'll try to speak a little more loudly. My name is Michal Khatuel Radoshitsky. I am a researcher at the INSS. I research on delig delegitimization and BDS among other things, and in preparation for the conference, for the symposium, even though in our program we talk about the cognitive aspect and how it affects Israel in the international theater, I wanted to read a little bit and to understand a little bit more about the war over hearts and minds, which is the topic of today's symposium. And I found a few things. First of all, I saw that there are many ways to conceptualize this idea of the war over hearts and minds. And in Hebrew, it sounds very obvious, cognitive campaign, cognitive warfare, but in English, it has many expressions, many different ideas. We talk about cognitive warfare, but we also talk about information operations or information warfare or the battle over hearts and minds. And so there is a whole range of papers and articles that talk about the different levels of this campaign. And when I focused on academic ones that refer to cognitive warfare, I was surprised to find only one, only two papers that talk about that, one from the 1990s and one from 2013. And none of them conceptualize the matter of cognitive warfare the same way as we do in Hebrew in this panel, just to compare conventional warfare has more than 180 papers from the 1980s to this day. And when I looked in international media for articles on cognitive warfare, I only found six articles. And what's interesting is that five of them talked about the Israeli-Arab conflict or an aspect of counterterrorism, and they were from 2013 to date. With this thought in mind, let's go to the focus of today's panel, which is the media and a cognitive campaign in Gaza. And we all know that in recent years, the wars are not only conducted on the military front, of course, we're also talking about the legal and diplomatic or political front. And also we're talking about the media front. And in this context, Ronen Manelli, who is the IDF spokesman, has published an op-ed on May 20th after the events in Gaza in the prestigious Wall Street Journal. And in this op-ed, he says that the modus operandi of Hamas is very simple, lying. And I, of course, read this op-ed, and I thought to myself, how is it that an organization, a terror organization, uses media so cynically in order to convey one message, and how a state, a country, is using the media in a completely different way to convey a counter-narrative to what we hear and see on the media? And with that thought in mind, I would like to present our speakers, introduce our speakers, and we'll move on to the questions on the media and the cognitive campaign in Gaza. So Smadar Peri, sitting here next to me, is a commentator for Arab affairs in Yediot Acharonot. Next to her is Joe Federman, the chief editor of AP, Associated Press, in Israel and in the territories, and is also the chairman of the Foreign Press Association. And at the end of the table, Ron Benishai, journalist, commentator, on the radio and on television in the military theater and also on Ynet and he is also the Israel Prize Laureate for 2018. Okay, so let us begin with one identical question for all three of you and I would like each of you to limit your answer to five minutes. And let us begin with your review or your understanding of the place the media has or the role it plays in cognitive campaigns. And we're talking about Gaza in particular and what you think the outcome is. So let's begin with you. Why do you want to start? 
Why? Because I want to talk about the Arab world. Okay, so let you start then. Well, I would recommend that you read what the INSS has published this year. It conceptualizes and does all the wonderful things you were looking for, and I'm wondering... Okay, so we'll talk about Professor Yoram Perry, of course, or make note of the fact that he wrote this publication. Yes, Professor Yoram Perry wrote everything you need to know about that in a very up-to-date approach. And in fact, I could recommend to anyone sitting in this room to read this publication. That would make redundant the discussion about conceptualizations, and because I've been taking part in such discussions for at least 40 years. I'm sorry, if speakers in the audience don't speak into a microphone, it's very hard for me to interpret. Well, I've read this publication from cover to cover because it's very interesting. It's a very interesting and important topic. And I can tell you that everything you need to know is right here. Now, you asked about the Gaza conflict and the cognitive aspect thereof. And in fact, there is only a cognitive aspect to this battle that is taking place in Gaza because everything else, let's say the kinetics, either serve the cognitive purposes of Hamas or else they cause us detrimental effects in the world opinion. And the last events, the recent events in the Gaza context are cognitive events, even though they do have a kinetic aspect. And what do I mean by kinetic or cyber aspect? It is a cyber effect of a cognitive event. And why am I being so particular and in going into the nitty gritty of these things? Because I'd like to go right ahead to my message and end with it. And my message is very simple. Since the Soviet Union collapsed, battles in the world have not been ideological. They have ceased to be ideological by nature. Most conflicts, not most conflicts, all conflicts are about identity. There are complex identities. For instance, I am both Syrian, Sunni, and belong to world jihad or support Turkey, let's say, or support the US. Maybe I'm a Kurd, but it's a matter of identity. And alliances are forged based on identity, and so are adversaries. And mostly identity is strongest. I'll give you an example. During the Iran-Iraq war, Assad, Hafez al-Assad, Bashar al-Assad's father, supported Iran. And why? He sided with Iran. And why? Because his personal identity, and it was first and foremost before his political identity as a member of the Ba'ath Party. The Shiites, the Alawis, are a faction within Shia. And the Alawis are a group within the Shiites, and Smadar, we have already discussed this 4,000 times, and we always argue about it. There's no need to do it again. But Bashar al-Assad, excuse me, Hafez al-Assad says the speaker supported Iran, even though the Ba'ath Party, who is the Syrians' um, party, was Iraqi. And even though he formerly was a member of the Ba'ath Party, and that's a matter of identity. And why am I underscoring identities so much? Because the connection between identity and image is very clear, very prominent, as in the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. It is a conflict of identities, complex identities. We are both Jews and so on and so forth. And the same is true for Hamas. But once there is a battle between identities, the image becomes more important than in an ideological battle because when ideologies battle one another, there is nothing to there are no images to uh, convey. It's more metaphysical, and the religions, priests, or clergy also tend to minimize 
the use of visual imagery that is used, whereas when it comes to a conflict between identities, we see that images have really taken over the, the, the center stage. And what happened in the last conflict in Gaza, which is why I wrote an op-ed and the IDF spokesman is still angry at me for doing that. He's angry at me because I criticized Israel very much. A situation emerged in which we, the Israelis, have become inferior and unnecessarily so in the visual arena. Now, this inferiority is not because we don't have images to put up, but that the images we have put up and that we have generated were not good enough in terms of the content that they were conveying. They were too distant, they came too late, usually after we already received fantastically good and beautiful images from the Palestinian side. And we also were not able to generate enough volume, enough visual volume in this respect of images. In several, several Fridays ago, on the Naqsa day, I went to the fence in Gaza, not in order to see the Palestinians. I know the Palestinians well enough, but in order to see what is happening on our side. And lo and behold, everything I feared was confirmed with some improvements. What was I afraid of? I was afraid of foreign photographers and all these guys who at first were placed safely in a safe distance away from the fence, meaning they couldn't take any significant pictures. What is a significant picture? A significant picture is an image that tells a story. To my surprise, and favorably so, after a while, after a while, <laughs> the spokesman or the spokespeople of the Southern Command came and allowed us to get nearer to the fence, to see things from up close. And indeed, the coverage that day, and it just so happened that the demonstrations were far smaller than expected, but the coverage that day was excellent. Moreover, when I already got to the sniper's post, thanks to the IDF spokesman. First I wanted to get there on my own and then forces were sent over to remove me immediately from the area of the fence so that I wouldn't, God forbid, take any pictures and actually see what's happening. And Reuters will can, t can say if they have any good pictures from the Israeli side. But then I saw Ziv Koren. Ziv Koren, I saw him leave the post. He's a photographer who knows how to take good pictures, who knows how to tell a story, who has his telescopic lens 20 meters away from the fence. He had a gas mask on so that he wouldn't have to breathe the tear gas like we did, and he did the job. And he, and it was exactly what needed to happen. And it's a shame that it wasn't on the same day as the IDF was forced to kill 62 Palestinians. Because if the images had been, let's say you see a Palestinian coming near the fence, maybe a short 20-second uh, video, like we saw yesterday with those helium balloons that are made in the Hamas outpost. That's exactly the kind of example we don't need Ronnie Daniels' interpretations. And of course, I have every respect for him. I'm not saying he's not necessary. But once you see such videos, once you see such images, you can already distribute them online. And then, again, a picture is worth a thousand words, and a short video is worth a hundred thousand words, and so on and so forth. I think I have made myself clear. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to continue, but from the other angle, because I cover the Arab world, and it looks different. First of all, I talk about the result. What will people remember from this whole thing? They'll remember that the state of Israel has a lot of power, 
that the Palestinians in Gaza are weak, they're very creative, that the Israelis say to themselves maybe that had I been in their place, I would do exactly the same. We, the Arab uh, reporters, uh, found ourselves in a very uh, difficult situation. On the one hand, you've got the Israeli reporters, the military ones. They cover the Israeli part much simpler. We have to find uh, the connecting points to the other side. And I did. I found four people who kept talking to me all the time. Even uh, this morning, when I told them I was coming to this study day, and it looks different. It looks sad, difficult. And obviously, they rely on the fact that the world will remember uh, the story of the uh, nurse, that nurse that apparently by mistake was killed. I'm talking about Gaza. And after her, another person. There were a few poor people who really by mistake were killed. And of course, they brought it upon themselves. But out of despair, they don't have anything to lose. These are young people. And, uh, but look, they have four, five hours a day electricity. Water that are not potable, but just to whatever, wash. Very difficult conditions. And another thing, Egypt closes them down until Ramadan now. It, uh, th th there was a closure. Israel uh, only allows certain people to pass or to cross. So most of the people in uh, the Gaza were never out of Gaza. They don't know anything about going abroad. Uh, they only know what's happening in the Strip. Now, I'm in a very difficult situation because on the one hand, I'm an Israeli. My heart is given to Israel, etc., etc. On the other hand, I see what's happening in Gaza, which is very, very harsh. And where do I uh, play the game in this? Uh, that's one thing. Second thing, when I hear all the stories, and with those four people I keep talking to, not, none of them are uh, Hamas, Oh, some people are not even identified with anything. Uh, each of them finds his own uh, opportunity. One of them even allowed me to say his name. His name is Abu Sada. He's a doctor. I think people, some of the people even know him from all sorts of conferences abroad. He always appears. And he has a lot what to say and to argue. And he also admits mistakes. He's really willing to admit mistakes and make people hear it. And it's very complicated. Again, I, in my position, not just me, all people who are similar to me are really in a very difficult situation with this issue, which uh, Ron uh, presented it from the Israeli side. I talk about the Arab side, but also not just Palestinian side, but Arabic as well, Arab. In, uh, we, we have uh, two countries, Egypt and Jordan. Their situation is also rather difficult, and uh, I'll elaborate later. What about the media? How does the media impact the uh, cognition or the awareness? I think the media, the Israeli media, I really uh, repeat what uh, Ron said, because I read a few of his articles, one of them in Le Monde, where in the last part you admitted that you also got a lot of criticism. The Israeli media uh, sings the Israeli tune. It's uh, natural, of course, but it's part of the game. And we, it's part of the image, but, but we, the reporters on Arab issues, in a problem, I'm not going to defend the Palestinian side, but on the other hand, when I see the coverage here, this story of this nurse, for example, or similar situations, there were quite a few, then it's very difficult. What do I do? The Arab media, the Arab media, I just want to add something, says Ron. The Arab media has no weight whatsoever. No weight. It does, it's not important. Ron, let me just say a word. The Arab media is expert in creating sub-narratives. 
small anecdotes that immediately become representatives of the large narrative. I'll give you the example of the Muhammad Dura at the time in the second intifada. But there's so many intifadas, who remembers? Yeah, Muhammad Dura. And uh, now the story of that uh, um, journalist, the photographer, which, who was actually a Hamas person, and also the marchers and the nurse. They are experts, specialists in creating a very small story understood by all, and this little anecdote is what we call representative to the large Palestinian narrative. But it uh, moves much faster and is perceived much faster by the world. Another thing that's uh, very difficult for the Israeli uh, media, it's not just these small narratives which are important, but also the ignorance. Professor Gilboa, I just spoke to him a few days ago, and he said that he came back from South Africa. The security cabinet of South Africa made a decision to demand from Israel to exit the Gaza Strip and to stop invading Gaza every time and again. Just, this, is, this is a resolution which derives from ignorance. Now, ignorance is part of the reality today from the post-truth. People, uh, yeah, knowing the facts, of course, is uh, something that nobody, uh, the facts, uh, uh, you're right. Joe, the role of media and the cognitive campaign and the results. First of all, if you think, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't, nothing personal. Okay, the question is a very interesting one, but I don't like it. I don't think, and by the way, I uh, apologize for my Hebrew. I hope you have the patience, because English is his mother tongue. But let me say uh, two things in English. What's the role? I don't think about awareness or cognitive, or what do the sites look like. I'll say it in English. I hope you all got that. So we want to talk about the agenda. Uh, this issue of the Gaza conflict uh, really uh, stops me sleeping at night, like many other people in this room. So the questions I ask is how can I, and I have two hats here, I represent the foreign media, that's another uh, concept I don't like. There's no foreign media. There are people who work in the foreign media. And we talk about a huge spectrum from Al Jazeera here until the Christians on the right. Uh, they're more right wing than the could. So there are all sorts of uh, opinions from all over the world. So you cannot generalize. But I can talk about uh, my position in AP. Our goal is to be the most balanced, the most fair possible. So I have to look at it and also have an advantage. And it's a great honor for me to sit with these two, I know your names, so many years, to uh, sit here with such famous people at the dais. You said famous. You didn't say... <laughs> I uh, choose my uh, words. You didn't say good, you said famous. <laughs> At least he spells the name right. But I do have an advantage that I have a team in Gaza, and I myself and my team, we have a few foreign reporters as well as uh, uh, international media, and I know many people who actually go into Gaza and come out of it. So our advantage is that to look on both sides. So every time I write about it, I have to ask a million questions. Obviously, I want good relations with the uh, IDF spokesman. 
I don't know how many trips I made uh, to the border in the south and briefs and whatever. I also have to look at what's happening in Gaza. So I also think about the situation of Hamas. I think about the situation of the people and the uh, settlers in the south and the entire situation. There are facts and pressures from million angles and somehow I have to explain it to the entire world. And AP has a huge responsibility that when AP comes, according to our Director General, it comes to all corners of the world. So I write for billions and billions of people. So how can I explain what's happening here? And what happens in the end, I try, and I have editors in Cairo. They're not Egyptians, but our headquarters in the Middle East is in Egypt, in Cairo. There are other uh, bosses in New York, and there are a lot of layers that uh, look at what we're doing. We have very strict uh, regulations, what to write. We need sources, we have to prove, you have to be sure that we were balanced, so we're trying. Unfortunately, both sides don't like me. I have problems, so then you're okay, then you're fine. So I want to think that this is a good sign, but it's not pleasant. I want the whole world to love me. I'm a very nice guy. Uh, <laughs> I uh, serve in a very nice uh, um, profession, but I don't know anyone, at least international pe people, I don't know anybody who gets up in the morning and says, how can I uh, damage Israel? How can I harm Israel? It doesn't work that way. I have to look at everything that's happening and I think that the advantage of international media is that uh, we have an angle or a worldview which is wider than the Israeli media. And this is something natural, it's not a criticism. It's just we have an audience which is much wider, it's something else, different, and that's how it goes. So again, I asked uh, regarding uh, the cognitive impact and the result, let's relate to that, to the, what happened in Gaza. You spoke about your limitations, but the results, how did that impact your writing? Depends who you ask, because the Israelis, they think that we are not okay. You should see how many complaints I get from the Palestinians. I got a complaint from a woman who made the research. I don't think it was serious, but she says, that we quoted Israeli sources 11 times more than Palestinian sources in this entire conflict. And I get uh, complaints from the Israelis who say, why do you always present the uh, version of the Palestinians? So you can't satisfy everybody. Okay, in any case, uh, it does have an impact. Of course it does. Smadar, I'm going back to you. You surprised me when you said that there is no cognitive effect. So I'd like to focus. There is no weight, is what I said, to the press coverage, because leaders here as well in Israel do whatever they want, whatever they think, and the media, for the most part, is goes after them, the military correspondents. And we have the other side, but it's very complicated because we can't go in there. The Arab side, goes after its leaders too, so I don't think there's any weight. Maybe be because there is no connection between the two sides, the media here creates the cognition. But it's not as if there's no connection at all, because as I've said, I spoke to four people, and important people at that, yes, but there are very few people like you. Yes, it's true. But it's a very complicated affair, and when you look at it from a bird's eye view, in the world in general, the Palestinian side, always comes out better. Well, because you cover the Arab world, how is the cognitive campaign in Gaza perceived among the Palestinians and also among the Arab world at large? Well, there's the story now of the disconnection, the dissociation between the West Bank and Gaza, and the situation is far worse. Their situation, the Gazans, as opposed to those in the West Bank and even in Israel. I mean, 
With Israel, they know that at some point they will reach a solution. Somehow they will end up talking and something will end up happening. With Abu Mazen today, on the other hand, the, com the, the, the situation is far more complicated. And that's what they're talking about on the Palestinian street. Yes, on the Palestinian street, they're first of all talking about what's happening within Gaza. That matters to the most. And then the next thing they talk about is the aid that they're getting, which is decreasing and that's also something that, something that needs to be taken into consideration. The third thing is Egypt, who cares about nothing. They just want them not to be in the Sinai Peninsula by no means and to take care of things. Egypt doesn't see things eye to eye with Israel. They see things a little differently as far as the situation with Gaza is concerned. I think that we have greater interest in Gaza than they do. The Egyptians just want to go, give them instructions, perhaps make it clear to them that they can't do anything on the Egyptian side, and that's it. Jordan is busy doing other things. The West Bank, as I've said, and every so often we hear stories here and there about a hospital, or all sorts of things like that, but at present nothing is coming of it. And another thing that I haven't managed to clarify, but I think it's in the process of happening, and that is talks, negotiations through Qatar. I don't know if it's actually direct negotiations or through all sorts of uh, agents, but it's happening and it's not easy. That's not easy either. Okay, Ron, I'd like to ask you, You have been in the media for a long time and you have gone from broadcast media to internet press, yes, online press. And what I'd like to ask, and I'm talking about the recent events in Gaza and to the local audience, do you see a difference in the cognitive impact between the various kinds of media? In Israel? No, I mean, we saw, you mean internationally? No, uh, locally, on local audiences. Well, from what I understand, it's not an audience, it's audiences in the plural. There are various kinds, and I think that those who are my age and let's say 20 years, give or take more, they are still affected by screens, by the television. The younger audiences I discovered to my great surprise, and that's why I have now shifted to online press, which I didn't, I sort of stumbled into. They don't even see online press on their computer. They consume online media. They consume the news on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on all sorts of social media outlets like that. And they also consume, those who are more interested, they use the online websites. However, what is more interesting is that even the younger audiences no longer go on the o online using their computer, but only on their mobile devices. Now the mobile is the message in terms of up to the age of 30, 30 plus, mobiles are the key media through which they consume news and current affairs. I see that this is making the audience here excited. This audience sitting here We don't consume news on our mobiles, but mostly on our laptops, on our PCs, on our tablets. And what are the implications? Well, the implications are that when you read on your mobile, not only us with our half-blind eyes, but those who are younger than us, they're not going to sit and read a thousand-word text on their mobiles. And I think that is what really the message should be. They consume op-eds and background. For instance, on my, um, in, in my area of things, the Rotter website on security or the Debka 
water is, of course, four times more uh, reliable and credible than Debka. And I'm sorry, I hope I don't get sued now for libel. But these websites provide, yes, I should say allegedly, allegedly four times more reliable. But these websites provide the public with videos, sort of text, uh, little excerpts of text, where they provide the public with what they want to know. And they don't care about anything more than what Rotter has said, that according to foreign media, we did this and that in Syria, we attacked in Syria. What Enziv says on Rotter, that is really like the oracle, that is... Uh, uh, and, and if you want to know more, you go to Ynet. And by the way, you go to Ynet and Dwala, and they're pretty good. They're not too bad. But that is just like one step higher. And now you want to ask who affects, uh, who, is, who are the most influencing in media? They are the influential media. Can I say uh, something that has nothing to do with your question? Yes, you may. Well, when you talk about the war over hearts and minds or the cog or cognitive warfare, Israel is inferior by nature. We are Goliath, and they are David, literally, with their slings, with their kites. Remember who was the last to use the exact same vehicle? Do you remember the, Samson, the Samsonite uh, foxes, faxes of Samson? He tied up tails of foxes with uh, sort of a burning um, torches. And I don't want to continue with this anal analogy, but he ended up in the Gaza temple and making it collapse, killing himself and the Philistines at the same time. And why didn't I think of this analogy when I wrote my op-ed? But anyway, the state of Israel is currently inferior. It, and it's an, it's an embedded inferiority when it comes to tell its story. Because at least in the free world, the underdog is, the, is right, always right. And because we don't go into the resolution of understanding who started it and who carried it on and why, and there are also sort of contrasting narratives. There is no one true narrative. There are sort of... Um, colliding uh, narratives. So if I scream my narrative more loudly and I bring all sorts of little anecdotes that demonstrate it a uh, little... <laughs> a little nurse is being shot at and so on. On Nakba Day, if we had had the image of a Palestinian with their face clearly cutting the fence, the barbed wire of the fence, and then another friend of his who throws a bomb, a sort of makeshift bomb at his IDF soldiers, perhaps things would have looked differently. However, that's the problem. We don't have it. Listen, that day I looked day and night for such images, but we don't have it. Now we have it more. But that day, that day when the entire world was criticizing us for having killed 62 Palestinians, we did not have such an image. And perhaps it just didn't happen. The IDF spokesman, may I? The IDF spokesman has people documenting things. Soldiers with cameras, who document things. And the problem is that these soldiers only document. They don't know how to tell a story. They don't know with their cameras to tell stories. Ziv Koren, who is a, a, a well-awarded, highly awarded photographer, can with a single image tell a huge story, such as the picture of the Kappa in the, in the Spanish Civil War. Not Guernica, of the man 
from not exactly an underground, but the International Brigade, who was falling backwards with his rifle and his head falls off, or the image of the little girl in Vietnam who was burned because of napalm. All these images turn Israeli um, public diplomacy, or Hasbara, as they like to call it, as completely redundant. And from that, let's move on to Joe. I read somewhere regarding the coverage of uh, conflicts in the world, uh, China, Tibet, Turkey and Kurds, and Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and I won't surprise you that the baseline of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict is up here, and the Tibet-China is down there. There is a lot of interest in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There are many images. We're talking about images. Very strong images that come from this conflict. The question is, in the cognitive international theater, how much can Israel uh, put in, from a moral point of view, such images that uh, convey a thousand worlds. First of all, I agree with you that if it weren't like that, I wouldn't have to uh, run after the prince from London for three days. Everything that's happening here is interesting. What happens in Jordan or in Egypt or in London, when it happens here, it's a big deal. And why? Because. Uh, there are a lot of theories, and I think it's because there's a lot of interest in this place because of their religion, the connection with Jerusalem, the Holy Land, uh, 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 with the Jewry all over the world. And I think it's connected because Israel, it's a very close relations with the United States, so the Americans feel some sort of a contact with Israel. And I have a lot of thoughts about this, but all in all, on the computer, we can even test it. At the end of the day, when we uh, uh, put something on our applications, our apps, we check. Everything that comes out of Israel, the market uh, rises. It's always up. The moment that the uh, prince falls down or something, everybody knows about it. Uh, you're talking about a billion people that you are catering to. So sometimes I don't want people uh, to care about it, but they do. You cannot escape that. So that's what it is. What was your question? <laughs> Does uh, that enable Israel to uh, convey messages at all? Oh, I wanted to add something else. I think that I think you will be interested. Sometimes Israel pays a price. Uh, if you want to control the message, be like Syria. Shut everything and kill uh, journalists. No, in Syria it doesn't work. Today you get uh, piles of information. There's so much information that comes from Syria. What, that when Israel uh, sh uh, shoots at unarmed people in Gaza, that's what you want to show them? So this is the situation here. People are interested in this place, and there are quite a lot of material for journalists on both sides. Finally, somebody who has a gun in his hand, he's the one who decides what's happening. No, there's a response to what the gentleman just said. There's a difference. Are you listening? There's a difference between killing a journalist be because he's a journalist and because he reports whatever he reports, then a journalist who gets killed uh, by crossfire, by chance, it happens. There are also Israeli journalists, quite a few who were killed. Not too many, but there were. So I ask you, if you uh, shout such a comment, which is loaded, 
make uh, notice the very small difference between killing a journalist in order to silence them and crossfire killing. I uh, got hit three times by a bullet, not the same bullet three times, but three times. One from some Albanian somewhere. Anyway, we spoke about the reality here. People are very interested in this place. There's freedom for journalists to work, so Israel has to cope with this environment. And uh, yes, but Israel in this environment has to cope with images. And we just said that, uh, so that's my criticism. My criticism is constructive, constructive criticism. But from what I saw, for the last three months, these are the mistakes, in my opinion. First of all, I think that the international media is very, very open to hear what Israel has to say. I see Jonathan over there. How much time do you sit every night? Five, six hours? How many times did we sp speak together in the middle of the night? People want to hear. Every time that there's a debriefing, people are listening to it. I uh, was criticized because we hosted in AP, in the uh, Foreign Press Association. We had an event with a minister in the Israeli government. He, of course, defended the Israeli behavior. I personally, or AP, we wrote a very long reportage on his uh, complaints. The Palestinians were uh, livid. How come you present their point of view so it's in demand? People want to hear. So they want us to write what's happening and what the Israelis have to say. However, for the last three months, there were a few mistakes. I made a list. Short, please, because I'll... First of all, too slow. Sometimes it takes hours, sometimes it takes days to get an answer to a question. Sometimes I have one question, I have to wait for a month for a reply. The laws here, there's something, the uh, want uh, us to say something and without sources, without, uh, it doesn't work in the international. You always have to report where you got the source. Uh, I remember the beginning, I went to the southern border. I was, uh, I had a debriefing with some commander. I don't know, something, uh, something very senior. I sat with him for an hour and I, I couldn't publish one word. He said, it's not for quotation. You can say it doesn't work. This is a miss. It's a waste to allow somebody to explain and to talk for an hour and then you cannot publish it. So what did you do? Do you want me to continue? <laughs> I'll tell you what. No, no, we have a timetable here. I want to give each speaker just a comment because we were asked to actually finish now. Last comment, and in your comment, I'll be happy that you will uh, continue. Smadar, again, I want to go to the other side and to our role of those journalists who bring the story of the other side. It's a difficult program, problem. And I want to say that nobody remembers why it started, where it started, who's to blame. We look at what's happening today. Now, Israeli have no casualties at all. The Palestinians have many. The Palestinians have a very difficult situation. And another thing, most of the people who are there, I identified in one way or another with the Hamas, but there are many other people uh, uh, come uh, to convey the message to the Israeli uh, side, uh, neutral people, and they do exist. And the third thing, we, the reporters who cover the Palestinian side are in a big problem. Ron, and we'll end with Joe. I said everything I had to say, so Joe. Well, I had other mistakes. How much do I have? Half a minute, half a minute. 
I'll end. You didn't answer one question. I'm sorry, we can't hear. The IDF spokesman was so efficient. He gave you all these images in real time. What did you do with it? First of all, it wasn't in real time, because when we get the material, yes, we do publish it, but the quality of the material we get is not always good. The, the videos, it's all blurred. You don't know what you're looking at. It's edited. I have uh, photographers on the other side. I have images, my own images. When you see somebody standing 300 meters from the fence and somebody shoots him in the leg without any reason, they were journalists, not on purpose, I think. It's a shame that Ronen, but that's the whole point. That's the whole dispute. That's exactly the essence of the dispute. That doesn't, but what I wanted to say was there's no uh, criticism in international media about attacks that you attack in Syria, no criticism when you attack uh, uh, targets or, or missiles on rockets. That's not the criticism. It is when civilians are killed without any explanation. That's the problem. Many people were shot far from the fence and nobody understands why. I'd like to thank our speakers. Of course, we could have continued this discussion and to hear much more. Thank you very much.